for all of you online that are watching. We're so glad you're available to worship with us this morning. We just encourage you like we do when you're here just to sing out to him because he is worthy. He is worthy this morning. We have our lyrics on this on your computers so that you can join in and sing along. So would you join with us? Let's sing together. Who breaks the power? sin and darkness who love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shine like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory. The King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me.
Grace has a voice and it calls my name in came before I call Mercy was willing and it took my place in came before I call in came before I call and I was lost now I am found I was blind now all I see only this Jesus is my testimony every curse is in the grave my whole life has been redeemed free from sin Jesus is my testimony love is the nails it's the crown of thorns for the cross has changed it all love like the world has never seen before for the cross has changed it all for the cross has changed it all I was lost now I am found I was blind now all I see only this Jesus is my testimony every curse is in the grave my whole life has been redeemed free from sin Jesus is my testimony Hallelujah Hallelujah He is risen Let my song ever be Hallelujah, hallelujah, it is finished, this is my victory, from beginning to the end, and for all eternity, I will sing, Jesus is my testimony, I will lost, now I am found. I was blind, now all I see, only this, Jesus is my testimony. Every curse is in the grave, my whole life has been redeemed, free from sin. Jesus is my testimony. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed 
I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. We are chosen by Him. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I Surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel that Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all. Jesus, I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing 
blessing fall on me I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender all. And Lord, let that be our prayer this morning. That in the chaos of what's going on in our world, all of the fear that may be going on, the fear that stirs us, let us leave it at the feet of Jesus, that we surrender everything to you. Because love and fear cannot exist together. That inside the love of Jesus, there is no fear. But Lord, so many times we want to cling on to the things that we know, the things that we are aware of, the things that only our hands can change and fix. And Lord, what's going on right now is beyond our capabilities, beyond our knowledge, beyond of all those things, but yet we still want to grasp onto something that we can cling to that makes sense. But Lord, the beautiful thing about you is that you're so much high above all of this. And Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, that in our hearts we can submit to these things, these fears these actions, whatever may be going on in us, Lord, we can submit to you, that we can surrender into your love and allow you to take hold of us and do what you will, God, Lord. There's nothing more beautiful than being in a deep love relationship with Christ Jesus. And as we continue on to your word this, this morning in Galatians, we just pray, God, that we wouldn't be people, God, that are stirred by the world. We wouldn't be stirred by the judgments and the ridicule, but we'd be stirred in compassion and rejoice in knowing that you are in control and you have already won the victory. We love you, Jesus. We just pray all these things in your holy and almighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm glad you're joining with us here at First Baptist Church Littlefield. <clears throat> it is a great privilege and pleasure to be able to share God's holy word with you today. And some of you, you might be thinking, well, that's not Pastor Tanner. You're right. I do have a lot less hair than he does. Before all the events that have happened in our world today, our pastor had planned a little getaway with his family. And due to the current situation, he was unable to leave town. However, he agreed to go ahead and let me share God's word with you today. But no worries, he will be back in the pulpit next week. So grab your Bible, turn to the book of Galatians, buckle your belts and get ready for an amazing journey in God's word today. <clears throat> I was reminded this morning that our Lord is truly amazing and no matter what he is still in full and total control when I got up this morning I was not shocked that the sun came up you know why because I know God is still in control when I went outside I noticed that my peach trees were blooming I was reminded that the Lord is the giver of life and I am so glad that the church is not a building and that we have the technology to gather together as the body of Christ this morning. But I'm also glad that this is temporary because we do love to gather together as the body of Christ. So what an awesome time we have had each Sunday as we've studied God's holy word through the book of Galatians. 
It's a tremendous epistle that Paul wrote to the region of Galatia. This is a great study for us because we can take great application from this study as it applies to our walk with the Lord as Christians. The theme of this great book we have been studying is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, where it states, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So last week we started chapter 3, where Paul came at them very strong. He stated, Who bewitched you? I guess they had been put under a spell by Samantha Stevens. Some of you who are younger than me are wondering who in the world is Samantha Stevens. And the ones who know what I'm talking about, you just twitched your nose. Okay, enough of the playing around. Let's get serious and get into God's word. Anyway, he tells them it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. So they had received Christ by faith and not the works of the law. He tells them, are you foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And he left off stating, the righteousness shall live by faith. Today, we are still in chapter 3, and we're going to pick up in the 15th verse of chapter 3. So if you have your Bible with you, direct your attention to the 15th verse of this chapter of chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, the verse is on the screen there for you. In Galatians 3, 15 through 29, let's read it together. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guarantee until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith, but now the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay, so I want to turn our attention to two things as we study this great chapter in Galatians. And those two things, if you're taking note, you can jot this down because this is going to be our main theme. It's law and the promise. So we look at these two things. We look at the law and we look at the promise. So before we dive into this chapter, let's look at the problem Paul was addressing here. How... Can mankind, sinful by nature, come to God holy by nature? Paul's answer is this. There is only one way. That is salvation, God's grace made available through Christ's death and his resurrection. So forget about merit salvation through obedience to the law of Moses. 
Man is sinful by nature and can't accomplish self-salvation or self-sanctification. You see, certain Jewish Christians, which we call them, and they are called the Judaizers, if you're taking note, were teaching such works are necessary that Paul's gospel was not correct and that he was not a genuine apostle. These Judaizers, they toyed with the gospel. They were Jews are us. So they had their rules, their regulations, and their rituals. As we have been studying this great book of Galatians, this has been the obvious message of Paul, is don't go back under the law. Getting all tied up and bound up with religiosity, with the rules, the regulations, and the rituals. Paul's answer was to proclaim the doctrine of justification by faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. And of sanctification by the Holy Spirit, not the Mosaic law. The answer was given in full apostolic authority received from Christ. All theologies that teach salvation by faith plus human effort are forcefully negated by this great letter in front of us. So in verse 15, it states, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Brothers, don't you love that word as he uses here? He said some pretty strong things earlier in this chapter. He called them, if they've been bewitched, he called them foolish. And now that he's getting into the theological part of it and explaining it, he uses a term of endearment as he says brothers when he addresses them. So he said, I'm going to use a human illustration. Let me use an example you're familiar with, said Paul. Once a man-made contract is ratified, and the definition of that is made official or signed, or in our terms, we may say notarized. Once two parties sign their names on a contract, neither can add to it nor take away from it. Now, you remember how he ended last week's study? It was Abraham, 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 and the Abraham covenant. He kept talking about how he came to know the Lord by the single condition of faith. He's just picking up where he left off. What he is going to do is show us that the promises that were made to Abraham are different from the statements that were made to the law. And that's going to be the main function for us to understand it. Okay, let's look at verse 16. And let's look at the promise. Now, the, promise, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and your offspring, who is Christ. So, here in this verse, in the minds of most, Abraham's offspring or Abraham's seed is synonymous with the Jews. But Paul contended, however, that the promise was made not to offsprings, but to one offspring. And that one offspring is Jesus Christ. The promise of God to bless the world come not through the Jewish nation, but through Jesus. Not through in any national entity, but through Jesus Christ exclusively to all people in all places. So as we look on, moving from verse 16 now into verse 17 and 18... This is what he says here. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified, but God so as to make the promise void, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, God made a promise, a covenant with Abraham, that through his offspring, Jesus Christ, everyone wanted to be blessed. 430 years later, the law was given. But the law could not take away the promise of the blessing given to Abraham. In other words, the law does not legally or logically have the power to negate the blessing God gave to Abraham through Christ. And Paul is about to show us that since we are in Christ, the blessings that come to us through Christ is neither 
given because we kept the law nor nullified by the failure to keep the law. The law is completely irrelevant and it relates to the blessing of God. What a fabulous truth for us. But God gave it to Abraham by what? By promise. It was when Abraham had no children that God told him his offspring would number as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. But scripture records that Abraham believed God anyway. Okay, Lord, Abraham replied, I don't know how you're going to do it, but if you want to bless me that way, it's fine with me. And he believed. And God said, that's the faith that will justify you. Abraham just believed God. Time passed. And again, the Lord appeared to Abraham. I am your shield, your great reward, he said. That's great, Lord, answered Abraham. But I still don't have any kids. The years are going by, and I'm not getting any younger. Abraham said the Lord, let's cut a covenant. In Abraham's day, when two parties wanted to seal an agreement, they would cut an animal in half and meet each other in the middle, thereby saying, we are dead serious about this. So Abraham got a bullock, cut it in half, laid it out, and sat there waiting for God to show up. He waited and waited, wondering where God was. When the birds started swarming around the carcass, Abraham shooed them away. Time passed. Abraham's eyes grew heavy. His head started bobbling and slumming. Finally, he was sound asleep. Sometime later, he awoke, looked at the bullock, and saw it had been barbecued. God had come when Abraham was asleep and had moved all the way through the carcass. And this is found in Genesis 15, 17. God didn't meet Abraham halfway, guys. He did the whole thing, saying, Abraham, the promise I'm giving you is not based upon your agreeing with me or doing your part. No, I'm going to do it all. I'll even do it while you're asleep. God still does it all, precious people. Your salvation, the blessings that are poured upon you, the works of the Spirit flowing through you in your ministry, it is all God. You say, don't I have any part to play, you ask? Yes, your part is to shoo away the birds of unbelief that will inevitably come and pick at the promises of God's word. Whatever God said he will do is an accomplished fact, guys. Yet vultures of doubt and buzzards of cynicism will come and say, God's not going to use you. He's not going to bless you. You haven't been praying enough. Peck, peck, peck at these birds of doubt come along. Your part is to chase away the birds by saying, Lord, you told me you would supply all my needs according to your riches. You told me you would never leave me or forsake me. You told me you're preparing a place for me in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. So looking at verse 19, it says, So why the law? Why then the law? If our walk is to be based simply upon believing what God said, receiving his promise, and resting in what he's done, then why was the law even given at all? It was added because of transgression, till the offspring should come to whom the promise was made. Because of sin, the law was given until Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world, came on the scene. So in Galatians 3.21, it states, Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been given by the law. Does the law given to Moses contradict the promise given to Abraham? No. The law doesn't contradict the promise. It simply gives an alternative to the promise. The law offers man a choice. You see, we can either receive a righteous standing before God by simply believing in Jesus Christ, or we can take every point of the law. If any legal system could bring a person to salvation, it would have been the Ten Commandments. The law is absolutely perfect. The only problem with it is this. 
it can't be kept. You can't keep it. You've heard it said, you're to love your neighbor, but I say you're to love your enemy, said Jesus in Matthew 5. Therefore, if you've ever been angry at an enemy, you're guilty. You've heard it said you're not to swear falsely, that you're to commit your oath to the Lord. But I say unto you, anything more than a simple yes or no is from the evil one. So if you've ever failed to love your enemy or made a promise and backed it up with anything more than a simple yes or no, you're guilty. Galatians 3.22 states, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. No one can be justified by keeping the law. All the law does is tells us that we're sinners and we need a Savior. That is why it was given. You see, the promise given to Abraham perceived by centuries, the law given to Moses, grace came first. But man began to think, I don't need to be a recipient of grace because I'm pretty good. I don't need to embrace this promised seed because I'm, I'm doing okay. So they began to write books like, I'm okay, you're okay, and esteeming yourself highly. The word, however, says there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that seeketh after God, Romans 3.10. There is not one person who can say, because of the sincerity of my search and the integrity of my pursuit of truth, I have discovered God. No, the Bible says none seeketh after God. Zip, zilch, zero, none. God sought you. But in order for you to realize that you needed to be sought, the law was given to all mankind as a mirror, saying, take a look, you're a mess. Here's the standard of righteousness. It's beautiful. It's workable. It's profoundly simple, but you cannot keep it. You see, the law serves as an incredible, important purpose. It is the schoolmaster that brings us to our need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, wrote the psalmist in Psalms 19.7. Who is converted? The person who hears and understands the law. For without hearing and comprehending the law, people would not appreciate and receive the good news of Jesus Christ. So I, I believe this is a fundamental mistake we often make in modern day evangelism. We present the gospel, the good news, that Jesus loves us, that he died for us, and he wants to take us to heaven to be with him forever. But we don't talk about the law. We don't talk about the bad news. We don't talk about the concept of salvation without saying anything about the consequences of sin. So let's put it this way. Let's, let's take a little journey and, and talk about a little story. Let's just say you're on a 747 plane headed on vacation. Two hours into that flight, the pilot calls for the senior flight attendant and says, hey, there's a leak in the tank. We're not going to make it plane is going down. Here's some parachutes. Pass them out. Well, the flight attendant, wiping the sweat off her brow, dabbing the tears from her eyes, smiles as she returns into the cabin saying, greetings, passengers. Could I interest any of you in a parachute? It will make your flight more enjoyable, and in it, I think you'll discover a new measure of peace, joy, and love. Who would like a parachute? Maybe three or four people might raise their hand. If you're among the three or four taking one, you see the other passengers snickering and pointing at you. Before long, you discover your parachute is tight and it's uncomfortable. You begin to think, this isn't giving me any joy at all. This is ridiculous. And after about 20 minutes or so, you take it off and say to the stewardess, you, you lied to me. You promised I would be comfortable, full of joy and warmed by love. But all I got was snickers and a rash and people making fun of me. Such is what we see happen all too often in present-day evangelism. 
I was promised love, joy, new converts may complain or say. But my friends made fun of me, and I felt restricted. That's why many people who come to Jesus turn away from him. Let's look at it this way. Another stewardess in the same situation hears the message from the captain, except she enters the cabin saying, Stop what you're doing. Put down your reading material. I want your full, undivided attention. The captain has informed me that the plane is losing fuel fast and it's going down. We are not going to make it. Who wants a parachute? Suddenly, people are fighting over parachutes. People want parachutes. No one cares if the flight for those remaining minutes is smooth or if they have enough mobility to play a video game here and there. No, everyone is clinging to his parachute, making sure it's secure because everyone knows the plane is going down. I suggest that oftentimes the reason we are ineffective in our long-term evangelism is because we have not been honest enough to people to say, hey, you're doomed. You're a doomed sinner. You have a hole in your tank. You have broken the law. You're headed for destruction. I could sit here and hold your hand and talk about warm, fuzzy thoughts, but I love you too much. You need to know the truth, and the truth is this. The soul that sinned shall surely die. But Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. Wait a minute, you may protest. I thought it was the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. In Romans 2.4, it is. But it sounds like, to me, you're talking about the severity of God. I am. They're, they're both valid. To the broken of heart, share grace. But to the heart of heart, share the law. For the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Those who understand they're doomed and weep because of their sin, they don't throw off their salvation when people snicker at them or when something more exciting is present to them. I ask this very pertinent question. Have you shared the reality of the law with the unsaved people that you care about? Perhaps you've shared your testimony with them, and that's great. But if their heart was hard, they would probably say, I'm glad you found happiness. I'm glad it works for you. I'm proud of you, honey. I am so glad and I think that it's good for you, and it's a good solid foundation in your moral footing for you. I'm happy for you, but me, I don't need that. You see, such arrogance can only be penetrated with the presentation of the law. That's why the law was given to show people the plane they're on is going down, and they're doomed unless the gift of salvation, the promised seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, so let's move on in this chapter, in chapter 3 to, 20, to verse 23 and 24. No longer under the law, we see here. So the verse says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, our schoolmaster, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. We were in trouble because we were supposed to keep the commands of the law, but we couldn't do it. It points us to a need for a Savior. God, however, looks at believers not as being forgiven, but as though they have never sinned. Justification, just as if I never sinned. Why? Because God's a good guy, and he says, well, kids will be kids, sinners will be sinners. No, no, no. No, because the blood shed on Calvary's cross was so powerful, it blotted out every violation written against us. We know that from Colossians 2.14. So, in verse 25, we see heirs according to the promise. So, verse 25 says, But not now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized in Christ, put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, 
heirs according to promise. So we see here that we, we are under the promise and not under the law. So we look at our relationship with Christ. We don't have to add these boundaries of the law because it's all about our relationship with Christ. You see, Eve even tried adding boundaries. Let's look at this. If we were to look in Genesis of the fall, Eve said to the serpent, God said that we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat it. Listen to this. Listen to this. Nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said that. Eve added these extra boundaries. But you see, based upon our relationship with Christ, we are under the promise. And because of that, we want to walk with the Lord. We begin to hate what God hates and love what God loves. And we don't see ourselves walking in some of the sins that we had in the past because we realize our love for the Lord and we love Him so much that we just realize that this is about our relationship. So I want to close with chapter 4. In chapter 4, starting with verse 4, it states, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So it's about Jesus Christ. It's about faith in Christ. And the same thing that Abraham had. Abraham had faith in the Lord. And that is what brought him the righteousness and justification. Abraham was looking to the coming of Christ. And we look back at the coming of Christ and the return of our Lord. So before we go, I'm so thankful that you joined us today. We love each and every one of you. And we're so thankful that God is always, always in control of all things. And remember, God, he's never early. He's never late. He is always, always on time. As a reminder, we believe that giving is a form of worship to our Lord. We do have a way for you to give online if you want to go to firstb.com and go to the giving tab. So if you would, if you would this morning, if you would just bow your heads where you are, I want to pray before we leave, before we go. I want to pray for our country. I want to pray for our leaders as well as our pastors all over the world. We are in some trying times, but we do know that God is in full and total control. And we're glad that we can meet together as a body. So let's bow before the Lord and let's pray. Lord, we come before you. And Father, we are so humbled and grateful for your love for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the cross of Calvary, Lord. We thank you for your death, your burial, your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that we are not afraid, God. That even though we live in a world that's falling apart and people are running in, in fear, Lord, we pray that we can teach them and show them the truth of your love. Lord, we can evangelize to the world and show them that you are on the throne. And Father, we pray right now, we pray for our leaders, Lord, we pray for our president and, and our local leaders, Lord. Father, the decisions they have to make in the coming times, Father, that, that you would just lead them. And Father, we pray for our pastors all over the world. We lift up Tanner and, and all the pastors around us and all over the world, Lord, to stand firm in your word, Lord, to show that we have faith in you and we, do, we don't fear, Lord. And Father, we just, we thank you, God, that you guide us and direct us, Lord. And we thank you that you have promised to one day return. And this is our hope, Lord. Our hope and trust is in you. Father God, we honor you this morning. It's in your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.